Hello, my name is Chris Abel. I am a music teacher at Estes Elementary School in Owensboro, Kentucky. Thank you for joining me for this poster presentation on a literature review of English language learners in the music classroom. When I refer to English language learners in this presentation, I will refer to them as ELL students. Urban areas have served a large population of English language learners in the United States for decades. However, we have seen a huge increase in English language learner population in rural areas in the past 20 years. In fact, it is by 85.8% in rural areas. I was shocked to find this when I got to my job at Owensboro, Kentucky, where they serve 23% of the student population for English language learning services. That's over 100 students. That led me to conduct this literature review and my research question is what instructional content and strategies are best suited for ELL students in the music classroom. This will be a guide for any music teachers uh, to find ways that they can connect with these students and raise their content knowledge, but also their cultural competencies as well. The first thing that I found was super helpful is multicultural content, something that as general music teachers, we have tried to do a lot is have multicultural content. It's been a staple of the classroom for a long time. However, this provides some key tips in making those cultural connections. The first big tip that we have from the literature is that we need to be mindful of different cultures that share a language. A song from Mexico, just because it's in Spanish, is not gonna create a cultural connection to a child that's from Puerto Rico. This should be common sense, but it can be hard for us because we don't necessarily, if we don't speak Spanish or we don't know that home culture, we have to do some extra research on this to create those cultural connections. We should also not present these songs through a westernized lens when we're trying to create cultural connections. Forget the Taz and TTs, forget the majors, forget the minors, teach the song, have fun creating a cultural connection with these students and watch their musical competency increase. Next is peer group instruction. Uh, Zev Vygotsky in 1931 uh, proposed the zone of proximal development. He says that if you partner students with a lower level of competency with students of higher levels of competency, the student with the lower level of competency would be raised, scaffolding. And once they have raised competency, you can take away the other student and the student with the newly increased competency will perform better. This is also the case with English language learners, not just in the content of instruction, in this case music, but also in their linguistic ability as well. We must be sure that we create a culturally sensitive classroom for this to work at its most effective. Uh, make sure that students are open to other cultures. Once established, English fluent students will be more open to learning about a new culture and ELL students will have a chance to interact with their peers, which allows for practice of their new language. This is key in the interaction between social constructivism theory and culturally relevant pedagogy is that it creates cultural competency. Culturally relevant pedagogy was uh, presented by Gloria Ladson Billings in 1995. She insists that if a student's cultural, ethnic, and racial heritage is represented in their education, they will be more comfortable, they'll have higher understanding, and more achievement, which is all the things that we want. It does require more work and research on our part to make sure that it is an authentic representation in their education. It is important that we weave multicultural content and the constructivism theory into culturally relevant pedagogy in order for the most effective instruction of English language learner students in our classroom. As you can see, this is how it correlates. The other two go through culturally relevant pedagogy and you have a share back and forth between social constructivism and relevant pedagogy. Here is a QR code for my references. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at christopher.able at owensboro.kyschools.us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Elizabeth Hinton, and I'm the orchestra director at the Model Laboratory School at Eastern Kentucky University. I teach 4th through 12th orchestra, and I am also a PhD student at the University of Kentucky. 
Today, I'm going to talk to you about social emotional learning in the secondary music classroom. As you can see, here is my poster for social emotional learning in the secondary music classroom. Let's talk about the purpose first. There are many challenges our students face in education and society. Poverty, family issues, technology both in and outside of the classroom, bullying, and negative attitudes and behaviors. Social emotional learning strategies can help manage the students' emotional needs and help them problem solve stressful situations both in the classroom and at home. Social emotional learning involves a set of social, emotional, behavioral, and character competencies that are essential to success in school, in the workplace, within relationships, in the community, and in life. The purpose of the literature review was to provide an introduction to social emotional learning in the music classroom. SEL has been used in music classrooms in several ways. The implementation of SEL helps students make responsible decisions, care for others, and know how to behave both in the classroom and in the community. Teachers can access professional development training and several resources to implement SEL into their music classrooms. Next, let's talk about what is social emotional learning. Social and emotional learning, or SEL, is a process which can be applied towards child and adult development and implementation into a curriculum. SEL is the process in which adults and children can develop self-awareness and manage emotions through skills and lessons in the classroom. Below are the framework of SEL and within this framework, teachers can access professional development training and several resources to implement SEL in their classroom. Collaboration with music teachers from the district and or the state can be effective professional development experience. The music educator serves as a strong foundation for applying this knowledge base in general education to music subject specific areas. Now let's look at how SEL looks in the classroom. The teaching process of social emotional learning or SEL allows children and adults to understand and manage emotions and allows students to receive the support they need through their educational career. Teachers and students establish and maintain positive relationships while making responsible decisions. SEL leads educational excellence through credible school, family, community partnerships to establish learning environments and experiences. Here are some of my findings. Dr. Scott Egger has written a book and has created a workbook organized for music teachers and students to use throughout the school year. This workbook is organized into three different sections, self, others, and decisions. One of the first activities is asking students to identify emotions in music. An emoji work, word bank students can pick from to show perceived emotions in different musical elements. They can use the emoji bank to discuss how they feel while listening or performing to certain music pieces. Practice journals are a great way to monitor students' progression on a specific technique or a musical excerpt by logging their practice. Dr. Edgar added to the practice journal worksheet, what emotions do you feel while you were practicing and what else was going on in your day when you were practicing? These excellent questions for both the teacher and the student. Teachers can easily be distracted when teaching, as can students when practicing. Letting go of those distractions to focus on musical literature in front of you 
can be a difficult skill for some and easy for others. This mindset can be applied to all classes in school and other activities students may be involved in. Some of the takeaways were positive music teacher student relationships have positive effect on an array of outcomes from academic performance and interpersonal relationships. Teachers can develop self-awareness and students can develop self-management skills to achieve school and life successes. Music educators develop strong, positive relationships with their students. Below is a QR code for you to see the link of all my references from my literature review. Thank you so much for your time today and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Hello, my name is Jason Cumberledge. I am the Assistant Director of Bands at the University of Louisville. I'm here on behalf of Brian Silvey, Alex Schreer, and Josh Boyer to talk about the effects of pre-conducting and conducting behaviors on evaluations of conductors. We know that nonverbal communication is important in all walks of life, but how important is it for conducting or conducting behaviors uh, before the first note is even played on a stage? Is the audience judging the band, the orchestra, the choir based upon uh, the conductor behavior? The purpose of the study was to address those questions. There were two research questions in the study. Number one, would collegiate musicians evaluate conductors differently based upon their use of excellent or poor pre-conducting and conducting behaviors? Number two, what factors would collegiate musicians write about regarding their perceptions of these conductors? There were 214 participants in this study. They were undergraduate college students from three uh, large schools of music throughout the United States. Four student conductors were filmed displaying combinations of excellent or poor pre-conducting behaviors and conducting behaviors. Here you see the operational definitions of both. Pre-conducting behaviors were defined as everything before the preparatory beat. Conducting behaviors were defined as assuming the ready position, the preparatory beat is given, and one measure of 4-4 time was conducted. This methodology is based upon a previous research study by Fredrickson and others published in 1998. Here you see the four conducting conditions and the acronyms for each condition. Participants in the study watched these videos and evaluated them. Here is one example of excellent pre-conducting behaviors and poor conducting behaviors. Assuming a ready position, this is conducting behavior. And one measure of 4-4 time. Participants were provided paper response sheets that included IRB approved consent information. Again, instructions were identical to the previous study. We expanded upon the previous study by asking two open response questions. What factors imp impacted your ratings of the conductors and what was the biggest difference among the videos? Here you see some results in bold at the top, excellent behaviors, both pre-conducting and conducting received the highest ratings. Poor, Pre-conducting behaviors, the triangle and square were in the middle. This indicates that excellent pre-conducted behaviors resulted in the highest ratings of conductor competence, even when followed by poor conducting behaviors. These results are congruent with the findings from the Fredrickson and others study in 1998. Open responses uh, were evaluated in regards to what was the biggest difference among the videos. Uh, participants indicated that conducting technique, nonverbal cues, eye contact, facial expressions, and conductor's confidence level on the podium impacted their ratings of each conductor. The biggest difference among the videos, participants indicated that conductors approach to the podium and confidence level, nonverbal cues, were most impactful. 
Thus, conductors should immediately project such strength and confidence from the first moment in and around the podium. First impressions have profound behavioral consequences. Confidence is crucial for conductors. The excellent pre-conducting behaviors used in our study provide evidence that conductors should display them for musicians and audience members alike. And teaching these pre-conducting behaviors uh, and conducting deportment, stage deportment, uh, should be a core component of undergraduate basic conducting courses. The results of our study indicated that observers' evaluations of conductors begin immediately upon the first visual contact of that person. Conductors should strengthen the perception of their in initial appearances on the podium. And considering the importance that the conductor has on perceptions of ensemble performance, finding ways to positively enhance musicians and audience members' experience is a worthwhile endeavor. I hope you enjoyed this presentation today about the effects of conducting and pre-conducting behaviors. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Cumberledge. I am Assistant Director of Bands at the University of Louisville. On behalf of Matt Williams, Assistant Professor of Music Education at the University of Arizona, I am here to, today to talk to you about culturally responsive music programming in collegiate music ensembles. Culturally responsive pedagogy in music education is becoming increasingly crucial for all students in all types of music programs. The purpose of this study was to investigate the impact of culturally responsive pedagogy and music programming in ensembles, focusing on the musical values and point of view from the students. Participants were 278 graduate and undergraduate musicians enrolled in band, choir, and orchestra from two large schools of music in the United States. Results illuminated the need for a critical consciousness of diversity and uh, purposeful programming in all ensembles. There were four research questions that this study was centered around. Number one, do students perceive current ensemble programming practices as relevant and supportive? Two, in addition to race and gender, do differences in these perceptions exist according to students' age and ensemble type? What criteria do students value in ensemble programming? How are current programming practices experienced by the participants informed by or responsive to gender and racial diversity. So participants were asked if there was something about the programming practices for their primary ensemble that they could change. If there was something they could change, what would it be? And at the bottom left corner, you see table one. Composer diversity is the number one topic that would be changed. 43% of respondents indicated that there should be more composer diversity in programs difficulty level as it relates to the ability level of the ensemble was the second rated category. And you can see the others, variety, core repertoire, audience appeal, and thematic material were last. And you see in the results section, as I said, the largest amount of open response comments related to composer diversity, particularly a desire to see more female composers represented. Students enrolled in choirs felt that the music program for their ensembles was more representative and relevant to their race and ethnicity than students in band and orchestra. Males rated gender as lower in importance in programming than both females and those not identifying as male or female. Additionally, males rated race and ethnicity as less important than females. White students, while not differing in their rating of the importance of race and ethnicity than other students, did indicate that they felt that the music was more representative and relevant to them than people of color or less represented students. An example comment, quote, I think that both the preservation of fantastic works throughout history and the premiering of great new composers should be the top priority. I feel like, however, that the programming of new composers at this institution is done specifically because a person is diverse rather than the fact their compositions are good. So again, regardless of the uh, type of composer or what the composer looks like or the gender of the composer, good music must be programmed and students can quickly kind of pick up 
on what type of music is being programmed and the reason behind it. I think as conductors and as directors of, ense of ensembles, we need to communicate to our uh, students the reasons why we are performing music. Yes, the composer may be uh, from a uh, underrepresented demographic group, but this is still high quality music and I'm still performing it and still programming it. Students appreciate that point of view. Some other summary recommendations that you see in the bottom right hand corner of this poster. Ensemble directors should learn more about the unique backgrounds of their students and connect music programming with the individual backgrounds of those students. Get to know individual students' backgrounds. Two, teacher preparation programs should increase curriculum content that will aid the development of culture responsive pedagogy in music ensembles. Thus, in music education programs at universities and colleges, we should talk more about composer diversity and programming for diversity. And number three, for directors looking to increase composer diversity on concert programs, participant responses indicated that directors may need to have conversations with their ensemble about reasons for their programming practices. That's something that I explained a little bit earlier. So I hope you enjoyed this brief presentation today about culturally responsive repertoire. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jason Cumberlich. I am Assistant Director of Bands at the University of Louisville. I'm here today to talk to you about COVID-19 and the effect of the pandemic in college marching bands during the fall of 2020. The purpose of this study was to investigate college marching band students' perceptions of community during the pandemic. The study was guided by four research questions. Number one, what COVID-19 modifications were used in bands? What were students' perceptions of their marching band experience during the pandemic? What were students' perceptions of community during the pandemic? And what were students' thoughts about marching band participation in a post-pandemic world? Participants were, not, were uh, 765 college students enrolled in 10 marching bands across the United States. Uh, the bands ranged in size from uh, 70 to over 400. Uh, these bands were located throughout the country and were in various athletic conferences. The dependent measure was a Qualtrics survey. The questionnaire was pilot tested and there was also internal reliability and content validity uh, tests run to ensure that the questionnaire was measuring what it was supposed to measure. So let's address the first research question. What COVID-19 modifications were used in college marching bands throughout the country? Here you see table one and a list of modifications. There was a list of 14 uh, included on the survey. Uh, students could select as many modifications that they wanted that were used in the bands. You see the most common was six foot physical distancing. 93% of respondents indicated that that modification was used. We go down the list, regular masks, outdoor only for wins. At the bottom, you see uh, zero bands canceled the entire band season. 9% indicated other. And this was related to a ver variety of uh, aspects that weren't included on the original survey. The second research question, what were students' perceptions of their experience? Participants were asked if they felt safe in marching band during the pandemic. 83% said yes, 1% said no. Participants were also asked what, or how well they adjusted to the modifications used in their band. Most students adjusted very well. More were neutral, or 33% were neutral, and just 2.61% did not adjust to those modifications very well at all. To further address this research question, participants were asked if there was anything they were looking forward to that they were not able to do because of COVID-19. Here you see a list of the missing activities. Number one, football game performances. And we know according to uh, extant research that performances uh, lead to a feeling of community throughout the band, a social bonding through performances. And that was missing during the fall of 2020. Travel, a sense of community was number three. 
interestingly, towards the bottom, 21 respondents indicated they missed wearing their traditional uniform. Participants were also asked, or were also asked if they felt that their band's modifications worked well. Most participants indicated yes, they did work well. The sense of community within the entire band. Participants were asked about this. You see that responses included a strong sense of community, 35%, neutral, 45%, a weak sense of community, 19%. When asked to compare the sense of band community with previous years, 50%, just over, just over half the band indicated that there was a weaker sense of community compared with previous years. And here you see the statistics with uh, participants describing community within their sections. Strong, neutral, weak, stronger, same, and weaker. 40% weaker than previous years in their section. What were students' thoughts about marching band post-pandemic? Here is a summary of responses for anything that should be continued. So some positives. Number one, of course, no, nothing should be continued. 178 respondents. Others liked virtual presentations, increased attention to good health, modified rehearsal times, even digital materials, water backpacks, bell covers. Finally, a high percentage of students indicated that, that despite the experience of fall 2020, for non-seniors, uh, most students will uh, plan on returning in fall 2021. So quick discussion, overall 98% of participants indicated that they felt safe or at least somewhat safe. There were many missing activities, including missing performances. There was a lack of community. Some responses, I was looking forward to connecting with everyone around me, a student said. I hope that maybe next year I can get back to fostering connections with people because that is what makes the marching arts so wonderful. Many traditions were missing, including the inability or the inability to wear their uniform. This is uh, connecting with previous research that says performing in a full uniform is often a strong uh, recruitment tool for university bands. Should any activities, policies continue? As I said, virtual presentations was mentioned and increased attention to good health. Some, some comments related to that. There were lots of mental health checks that I appreciated. One student commented. Cleaning facilities regularly was another comment. Providing hand sanitizer at the field. Our attendance requirements were inappropriate before the pandemic, needing a doctor's note to mistraining. And I hope that this new policy of just staying home if you don't feel good will continue post pandemic. So according to the perceptions of College March Band students, feelings of community were lower compared to other years. Uh, it is cl clear that there are many challenges as a result of the pandemic, uh, but there may be a few things that we can take, uh, some positives that we can take, including uh, the virtual presentation aspect and increased attention to health, both physical and students also uh, reference mental health. Uh, that is very important and a priority for all teachers, uh, the safety of students. Uh, moving forward, uh, we, can we can conclude that uh, should any event like this continue or uh, happen in the future, uh, we can look to research like this to guide our intents. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Hello, my name is Suzanne Wilma, and I am a student at the University of Kentucky pursuing my master's in music education. I am also the general music teacher at Kennedy and Cordley Elementary Schools in Lawrence, Kansas. So recently I did a literature review about New Horizons ensembles and Irish sessions and what makes these types of music communities appeal to adult amateur musicians. A few years ago at the University of Kentucky, I 
um, had the privilege of attending a few rehearsals of the New Horizons Orchestra directed by Dr. Sogan. I had never seen an ensemble where adults were allowed to learn a new instrument in a setting that would very much remind you of a middle school or high school setting, but with modifications made for adult learners. And I thought that was amazing. It clearly meant so much to those musicians to be able to do that. Later on, I attended an Irish session at McTaggart Irish Dancers in Lexington. And there I saw experienced and inexperienced musicians helping each other out with techniques, helping each other learn new, new tunes, but the setting was much more casual. So I wondered if learning about why these types of music communities appeal to adult amateur musicians could assist music directors in forming new music opportunities for adults who want to join an ensemble. Maybe something like modern band for adults, for example. I know for myself what it means in my life to be able to make music with others. So understanding what makes these communities work could help expand opportunities for adults who want to participate in ensembles beyond these genres of music. Thank you. New Horizons was founded by Dr. Roy Ernst in the early 1990s, but now ensembles can be found all over the world. They are geared mainly toward retired adults who want to learn a traditional band or string instrument. And the rehearsal format would kind of be recognizable to you if you were a band or string uh, student in middle school or high school. So participants really enjoy the casual atmosphere. There's, it's very low pressure. If you make a mistake, it's no big deal. They get to make a lot of friends and they have a lot of fun performing in concert halls that before they had just been audience members in. So some participants believe that playing an instrument can prevent dementia and lead to fewer physical aches and pains and make them happier. They enjoy the sense of community, making new friends, the thrill of performing in front of an audience. But with all of these benefits, a 2011 study by Dr. PJ Jutras found that the most important reason that participants cited for joining was just for the music itself. Irish sessions can appeal to a different type of musician, one who prefers more independent learning rather than learning in a group setting. They're defined as gatherings of two or more musicians who play traditional Irish music for their own enjoyment. This gathering mainly takes place in the pub, but near where I live in Kansas City, there are gatherings that take place on driveways outside due to the pandemic or even on Zoom. Um, musicians are there for the purpose of making music for themselves. So they turn toward each other and of course, naturally an audience will form around them, especially if they are in a pub. Some have rigid rules, some are more casual, and it's important to observe the etiquette of each one before joining in. Some Irish sessions even make accommodations for adult beginners. Just like in New Horizons, socialization is a key aspect of the session. Since the musicians are turned toward each other and not toward the audience, the focus is on the camaraderie between them. There is usually no rehearsal or set list and strangers are often welcome to join in. Even though the purpose of the session is not to instruct new musicians, they can learn to play a new instrument independently with a private teacher or an academy like the Online Academy of Irish Music and then attend a session to try out what they've learned. According to Janice Waldron, the opportunity to socialize, engage, and relax with other like-minded people, along with the availability of beer, appeals to participants, although of course music is the main draw. Socialization and actual music making are the most important elements of these communities for participants, but they appeal to different types of learners and different musical tastes. As musicians, we know how beneficial playing in an ensemble can be to one's physical and mental health. But in order for an adult to reap these benefits, they need to find a musical community that matches their interests and their abilities. 
Further reading may reveal how to maintain the social aspect of both groups while combining the goal of learning a new instrument, as in New Horizons, with the goal of playing in a more casual setting with other musicians, as in an Irish session. Further reading may also reveal how to apply the aspects of each type of community that appeal to adults to community groups that specialize in genres of music that use instruments other than traditional Irish band or orchestra instruments, or even adults who would like to learn how to compose. This would be useful in expanding music learning opportunities to adults of all musical preferences, ability levels, and learning styles. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Abigail Van Kloppenberg, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Kentucky. I'm pursuing my doctorate in music education. Today, I'll be speaking with you about marginalized student populations in college music programs. I'd like to start by defining marginalization and speaking about who may be considered a marginalized individual. Next, I will discuss a literature review I conducted and two primary themes relating to it. Finally, I'd like to speak with you about implications and next steps for eliminating marginalization at your institution of learning. I'd like to start with a quote from Brown. To be marginalized is to be ignored. Individuals can be left out on account of not only in terms of power, but also in terms of esteem, friendships, and moral development. Or they can be marginalized with regard to education, income, security, and proficiencies required for physical and social progress. Keep this quote in mind as we continue to discuss marginalization. Individuals can be marginalized based on a variety of factors. This can occur based on their race, ethnicity, or cultural background. Social, sexual identity and orientation as well as gender may be a factor that leads to marginalization. Immigration status, religion, disability, and socioeconomic status could also contribute. These are not the only factors and may not work alone. When looking towards the literature review, I was guided by two research questions. First, what factors contribute to the marginalization process in collegiate music programs? Second, how can we better serve marginalized student populations in collegiate music programs? The first theme the literature review related to school music auditions in regards to marginalization. Studies show that college and school music audition processes may contribute to the marginalization process. Things such as required repertoire list and limited genres allowed for auditions may deter many students from auditioning for college music programs, even if they are musically proficient enough. Accessibility to application materials and instructions may also hinder students. Students may not be clear on the expectations for auditions and may not be adequately prepared to be successful when they are at their audition day. Another theme that emerged from the literature is talking about what exactly happens in college music programs that lead that contributes to marginalization. A 2019 study from Flaherty says that university faculty are more likely to be white than any other race. Diverse faculty play a huge role in the recognition and support of marginalized students. Studies have shown that marginalized students succeed more in college music programs when they're supported by faculty with a similar background to their own. In addition to faculty um, impacting marginalized students, financial limitations may impact students as well. College music programs are expensive as well as the ever rising costs of tuition may limit students who come from marginalized backgrounds. Now I'd like to speak with you about implications and next steps for eliminating marginalization in college music programs. First, universities need, need to reevaluate the audition system. Universities need to include more diverse styles and different genres, allowing a wider variety of students who are eligible to audition possible access to their university program. 
Universities need to actively go out and recruit students from diverse areas, specifically targeting students that have backgrounds um, in a lower socioeconomic status. Finally, the way auditions occur may need to change. Panels or other blind auditions may need to occur. This would help eliminate biases that may happen when students are auditioning. Finally, let's talk about policies that happen that need to happen to stop marginalization at the college level. When universities are changing policies, they need to be aware about the ways that their policies will impact students who are marginalized. There needs to be great effort to ensure that further marginalization does not occur as a result of their changing policies. Universities need to work to recruit, hire, and then actively retain a diverse faculty. Having a diverse faculty will help the the diverse students that are enrolled in college music programs. Finally, universities need to reevaluate their financial allocations. Resources, scholarships need to be allotted specifically for students from different marginalized backgrounds. Having access to funds can help offset the high cost of tuition and other factors that are of cost that um, impact a student's enroll enrollment in college music programs. As I conclude this presentation, I want to return to my original research question. I encourage you to think, how might we move forward and better serve marginalized student populations in college music programs? Thank you for attending this presentation today. If you'd like to follow up with me, please feel free to contact me with the information I've provided. If you'd like a reference list for this presentation, please scan the QR code. Thank you for your time.